I must apologize first because English is not my first language, so I'm sorry for any mistakes there in writing this. I'm from Paraguay, and I live here in the capital city, Asuncion. Like many of the countries in the world, we in Paraguay have also been affected by the virus outbreak. Everyone is very worried. They have been wearing masks and buying all of the groceries so that they can stay at home until everything is safe again. But more importantly, the government here in Paraguay has declared a curfew, and people who leave their homes without a good reason can be punished by the police. Also, if you leave your home and you are sick, you can be charged with a crime and thrown into jail. But the problem is that a lot of people in here in Asuncion are very poor, and even those who work make very little money. That means that both me and my father have to work to support our family. Even my mother makes and sells wicker baskets in her free time to give our family extra money. But that's where the trouble started. When the government here decided which of our jobs were essential and which ones were not. I had a part-time job in the tourism industry, giving guided tours of the markets and historical sites of Asuncion. But this was declared non-essential right away after the lockdown was declared. So just like that, I was out of work. My father is a supervisor at a manufacturing plant on the outskirts of the city. So for a while, he was still able to bring home money since he was declared an essential worker. But that all changed when he was tested at his job for the virus. When the test came back positive, he was told he would have to go home and isolate himself for two weeks before he would be allowed to return to work. This was a disaster for our family, but there was one flicker of hope. The head of my father's department told him that a temporary replacement had been found for him, but that left a space on the factory floor, one that I could occupy for the time he was sick. So every morning for about a week, I would wake up very early, grab my father's ID card, walk out of town for an hour so I could work the line at the manufacturing plant. It was a very boring job, much more boring than my tour guide work, but I was still very grateful to have the chance to keep earning money from my family. My family owns a car that we share, but since money was low and we couldn't afford too much gas, we had to save it for emergencies. That is why, like I may have said already, that I ended up walking four miles there in the morning and four miles back home in the nighttime. It was tough going and... I was stopped by the police many times, but all I had to do was show them my father's factory ID card and they would wave me on. But that only worked so many times, and one evening a routine police check led to one of the most terrifying, stressful experiences of my entire life. I was walking at the side of the road, my feet aching after a long day on the line, when I heard the momentary blare of a siren behind me. I stopped walking, turned around, and I saw a police vehicle parking up near me. Usually, I would just show the ID card and the police would drive on without getting out of their car. But this time, both officers stepped out of the vehicle and began marching towards me with a lot of aggression. I tried to show them the ID card to explain that I was an essential worker, working in place of my father, but they didn't want to listen. This is not your picture, one of the officers said asserting that I could not be a supervisor and suggesting that I had in fact stolen the ID from somebody. I swore to him that it was not true, that I had made arrangements and my family might starve without the income. Then, they searched me. When I asked what they were looking for, one of the officers got in my face and told me to shut my mouth, that I was lucky that they weren't just taking me to jail since I was out spreading the virus. I think they were searching me for drugs, but I can't be sure. I know a lot of dealers have been caught recently since they need to sell their stuff and have trouble explaining why they are outdoors during a lockdown. When they had finished their search and found nothing, I thought that they might just let go of me, but I was terrified to see one of the officers take out their electric taser gun, arm it, and aim it in my direction. I didn't think. I just raised my hands like it was second nature, showing him I meant them no harm and praying he wouldn't pull the trigger. The other officer reached into the pocket of his uniform, taking out his phone and pointing the camera in my direction. It was clear that he was filming me, but for what purpose, I was scared to know. I really thought I was going to be tased on camera, 
that they use the video as an example to others. Then the officer with the cameras said something that I struggled to understand at first. 50 star jumps, right now! At first I honestly thought I didn't hear his words correctly. These were words I had not heard since high school physical education class. I told the officer I didn't understand, but this only made him furious. Are you deaf? Or just stupid, boy? He barked at me. Fifty star jumps. Go, hurry. I simply did as I was told. I started doing the star jumps while the officers laughed, commenting that this is what happens to those that break curfew without a good reason. Repeat after me, one of them said. I'm sorry, officer. I will not leave my house again. Uh, I'm sorry, officer. I will not leave my house again, I repeated. Again! And I did so. Again! I said the words and jumped on the spot until I had no more breath in my lungs. I was still convinced that they would tase me when it was done, that the punishment wasn't over. But when I collapsed, feet and lungs burning from the work, they just carried on laughing as they got back into the car and drove away. These hard times are difficult enough without horrible policemen taking advantage of their power. I know they are not like that all over the world, that there are always a few bad people to many good ones, but I just pray that no one else has to go through what I suffered that evening. Good luck everyone, and be safe. Like a lot of people, I was pretty shocked when the government declared a lockdown here in the UK. I'm in my late 20s, so never in my life or any of my mates' lives have any of us experienced such a zealous curtailing of civil liberties. The lines at supermarkets began, road traffic dropped off to next to nothing. It's been a soft transformation of society, but a transformation nonetheless. As life changed, so did living arrangements, and one day, I noticed that the girl who lived alone in the flat below me wasn't so alone anymore. I passed her on the stairs at one point, backing off into a corridor to maintain social distancing, but noticed she wasn't alone. He was a harmless looking bloke at first, quite tall but skinny with a mess of curly sandy blonde hair. I said hi, introduced myself without all the usual handshaking and went on my way. Everything was hunky-dory, if I'm being perfectly honest. That was until last Friday night, when something happened that gave this whole lockdown thing a whole new meaning of terrifying. It started with a few bumps and groans from downstairs. I was playing Xbox at the time, willing the hours away with that new Call of Duty Warzone game with a few mates. The floors and walls in this old Victorian flat share are pretty thick, but make a loud enough noise and you can hear the bass in another apartment. So when I feel the flat shake a wee bit and hear the girl's voice, I roll my eyes and assume the worse. Uh-oh, I said down the mic. I think the girl downstairs and her feller are getting a bit familiar. This sparked off a round of laughter and off-colored humor, and I ended up turning my TV volume up to drown out any potential sounds of copulation. It was annoying, but... Hey, I've got my way of killing the quarantine time. I suppose they found theirs. But it didn't end there. Soon, loud, sporadic banging sounds from the flat below was making my flat literally shake. It was actually kind of alarming. I mean, Christ almighty, those pairs seemed like they were really going at it. I mentioned it to my mates in the party chat, and we all had a little laugh at the whole thing. But then something happened that meant I wasn't laughing anymore. I heard the girl cry out. And I know what you're thinking, but trust me, if you heard what I did, you'd have known something wasn't quite right too. It wasn't a cry of ecstasy, not in the least bit, but it sounded hurt, weak, terrified. As I said, I'd turned down the volume on my TV to block the sounds out, but... Now I was turning it right down again, muting the speakers so I could better hear what was going on. There were voices alright, and they were obviously trying to stay hushed, but you could clearly hear that some kind of heated argument was taking place. 
I mentioned this to the lads in the party chat, and yet again they made off-colored comments like, Sounds kinky. Just nonsense like that. But I quickly made it clear that this was something else entirely, and that I was actually kind of worried about the whole thing. We're literally talking about the prospect of it being some kind of domestic violence incident when there's yet another loud bang. So hard it makes my flat shake. Only this one was followed by a similarly terrified female scream. Then there was silence. My heart is absolutely pounding at this stage. Right then, one of the lads makes a joke about smelling something funny coming from the flat below in the next couple of days and how I might end up being the guest star of some sort of true crime documentary in the near future. Now, I like my dark humor, and I admit I'd have found that kind of thing funny if it wasn't in danger of actually happening. But given the circumstances, I was absolutely terrified. There were no more noises coming from the flat below. It was eerily quiet now. So I asked the lads in the party chat to bear with me because I was going to call the police. Immediately a few of them told me it was the right thing to do, that it's always better to be safe than sorry in this situation. So I do, and the dispatcher on the other end tells me to leave the front door of the building open so they can enter safely and deal with the whole situation. Only get this. The police arrive. I hear a lot of shouting downstairs. So I walk out into the hallway of the building to listen in on what's going on. Instead of actually getting in there and dealing with the whole situation, the police seem to be happy to just talk to the couple through the door of the flat. The whole social distancing thing hadn't occurred to me in the slightest when I called, and now the problem with my solution was becoming evident. The couple, within moments of the police arrival, had gone from at each other's throats to uniting to tell the police to get out of their building. They were actually shouting about a warrant and all this stuff, basically trying to find any reason to keep them out. It was nuts. I had read and heard about domestic abuse before, and this was one of the classic symptoms. Warring couples suddenly unite when someone else tries to intervene. They demand to know who'd made the call, and what I heard next had me emitting an actual uh-oh out loud. The cops bloody well told them. They straight up said... We received a call from the flat above you. They had dropped me right in it. It was quiet for the rest of the night, and the next day I tried to avoid them entirely, but eventually I had to leave the flat to buy food. And as I did, and was walking down the stairs towards the front door of our building, the girl below's flat opens up, and I see a figure standing in the doorway. He was wearing a mask one of those surgical ones, they've been popular since the outbreak, but it's clearly the abusive boyfriend, and he's holding a hammer, a bloody claw hammer, and he's just staring at me. I raise my hands and try to explain that I only meant well, but he just slams the door on me before I can finish my explanation. And that's how it's been for the past few days now, me being completely terrified for my life, locking my doors constantly and listening out for heavy footsteps coming up the stairs towards my flat. So seriously, if anyone has any advice or examples on how to deal with this, please, please leave them in the comments. I'll be reading every single one and responding to those I think can help via DM. Life can be very hard here in the Philippines. And here in Quezon, the largest city in my country, and the place where I live, life has gotten even harder since one man came to power back in 2016. Rodrigo Roa Duterte. He is often described in the same way as the American president, Donald Trump. People say he is a populist and an agitator, but honestly, our president makes Trump look like an angel. Duterte has been a very vocal supporter of the extrajudicial killings of drug dealers and those that do business with them. I know that certain human rights organizations have estimated that Duterte has been directly and indirectly responsible for almost 1,500 murders committed by what has been come to be known as the Davo Death Squads. There, they murdered without a care, even sometimes targeting children in their attempt to clean up the streets. 
It was bad back then, but it got even worse after 2016 when he became president, and the more I think about it, the more it seems like his entire reign was building up to today, when extenuating circumstances have meant that he is more power than ever before. Quezon has reacted to the COVID-19 crisis in a very similar way to other places. We have lockdowns, mandatory self-isolation, and food rationing. And naturally, the police force has been granted considerably more power in light of such an extreme health emergency. It seems to be quite a unique situation, in that the government has increased powers and civil liberties have all but been suspended. And yet, there is absolutely no outrage or protest from the people. They are scared, and scared people are very, very easy to control. They don't just accept the introduction of draconian punishment, they welcome it. And for me, a firm believer in human rights, it is a very, very scary time indeed. For example, just a few days ago I was walking to the market to buy essential food supplies when I saw a large crowd gathered near the market square. Hundreds of people were jostling for position to catch a glimpse of whatever it was that was hidden from my view, and they were quickly being dispersed by police who obviously were under orders not to let people congregate at all. When the crowd thinned out, only then could I see what they were looking at. It was a small cage, maybe only a couple of square feet in size, no higher than a man's thigh. I recognized it as a dog cage from the sturdy steel bars, the kind us Filipinos keep our pets in to keep them safe at night. But there was no dog in the cage. It was a man. He looked terrible, like he'd not eaten or slept in days, and worst of all, this was all taking place under the midday sun. He was being baked alive in public, with only the police throwing the occasional cup of water over him to keep him from passing out from heat stroke. I was in shock. I just stood there for a moment as masked individuals filed past me, staring at the man's fingers as he hooked them through the bars of the cage and begged for help. Too big, too big, he said over and over again. Water, water. A masked policeman approached him, tossing another cup of lukewarm water over the cage's bars. The man reacted like an animal lapping at the bars of the cage to catch a few droplets in his mouth, trying to catch what little he could on his fingers and palms, then licking them desperately out of pure manic thirst. The police just laughed as he did so. But I didn't. I couldn't even move. All I could do was stare at a man who had been reduced to something less than human, and it probably hadn't even taken that long to do it. Some people were recording the man on their phones from a distance, taking pictures to send to relatives and friends. I didn't even have to ask why he was locked in that cage like that because the policemen didn't waste time to tell me. Leave the area, one shouted at me, pointing towards the small steel cage, or you'll end up just like him. Tell everyone this is what happens when people don't practice social distancing, said another. I turned and walked away, very quickly, not slowing my pace until I reached the market square. When I was done, I walked straight back home, not stopping, almost flaunting my bags of groceries to any police officers that gave me looks. There was no way I was ending up in a cage like that poor man. Even if he had violated social distancing rules, there was no good reason to cage him like an animal. But the thing is, that's not even the scariest thing I've heard or seen in the past few weeks. In Cavite province, just south of Manila, two small children were forcibly locked inside an actual coffin on March 26th as punishment for violating curfew. In Bonando village, officials arrested four boys and four girls on March 19th for violating curfew. They forcibly cut the hair of seven of the children while the one who resisted was stripped naked and ordered to walk home. And these aren't just rumors either. These are things that I have seen videos of on WhatsApp. The Philippines already has a terrible record of criminalizing children with members of Congress attempting to lower the age of criminal responsibility from 15 to 12, with some having proposed it to be lowered to 9. If enacted... This could put more and younger children behind bars in dangerous detention facilities. 
and speaking of rumors. In October 2017, Rodrigo Duterte opposed passing a law against so-called fake news, saying that it would be unconstitutional as it can curtail freedom of speech. But just a few weeks ago, our president passed a law saying those who spread fake COVID-19 news may have their electronic devices confiscated, face jail time, and in some cases even be landed with an enormous 1 million Philippine peso fine. That's the equivalent of about $40,000. That's a punishment that could destroy someone's life, as we are not wealthy people here in the Philippines. I understand lies are bad and that scaremongering can cause panic, but to destroy someone's life for that is a horrifying prospect. But it only took a few days before destroying someone's life took on a very literal meaning. On this past Thursday, a 63-year-old man was shot dead after threatening village officials and police with a scythe at a virus checkpoint. Official news sources stated that the man is believed to have been drunk when he threatened village officials and police manning the checkpoint in the town of Nasipit in the southern province of Agusan del Norte. The suspect was cautioned by a village health worker for not wearing a face mask, the report said. But the suspect got angry, uttering provoking words and eventually attacked the personnel using a scythe. A lot of people here don't quite understand what is going on, only that there is an infectious disease, but not exactly how incredibly virulent it is. So please, I hear a lot of people complaining that it's very fascist to shut down society in such a way, but be grateful you are not in the Philippines where we are just as much in danger because of our government as the virus. So before this whole lockdown thing happened and my dating life went to hell in a handbasket, I used to swipe through Tinder and Bumble quite a lot, looking for girls to hook up with. So I'm bored in my silver-like apartment one day when I come across this absolute smoke show of a girl who was listed under the name Lilith. She had these big green eyes, wore pigtails a lot in her profile pictures, and had absolutely no qualms of showing off this big peachy butt she had. She also had this goth girl vibe going, which was something I find really attractive. I mean, she was definitely not the kind of girl I'd bring home to mom, but that's not really what I'm looking for when I'm swiping, so naturally, I swipe right. Boom. We match. I think I actually let out this involuntary no way when the old it's a match text appeared and kind of cynically told myself, nah, she's a bot, this isn't real. But yup, it was real and she was so cute to talk to. At first anyway because things started to go a little different when we actually met up. She worked at this coffee shop at the Getty and asked me if I wanted to pick her up after her shift so she could take me somewhere real special, which turned out to be the Museum of Death on Hollywood Boulevard. I mean, not my ideally romantic place to go on a first date, but like I said, she was a slam piece and it was basically impossible to say no to her. So it was decided and after I picked her up, she kept it the mystery for a while only telling me to drive her to Hollywood Boulevard before revealing where she actually wanted to go. The area around the museum is kind of sketchy, but again, I'd have driven through way worse neighborhoods for a date with this girl, so I just pushed all my concerns to the back of my mind. Despite the interior being as dark and dingy as it was, looking like an over-clustered basement, the whole thing was actually kind of interesting at first. But I'd be lying if I said my eyes stayed on the exhibits the whole time when they were pretty much glued to her butt whenever I wasn't going to get caught looking. It most definitely wasn't particularly creepy either, but the things that Lilith started to say to me as we were walking around the place did in a big, bad way too. Like I said, the exhibits were interesting, but that's all they were aside from being gross and spooky. There were death masks, body parts preserved in formaldehyde, all the things you might come to expect from a place called the Museum of Death, and then some. But this Lilith chick starts saying how pretty some of this stuff is, looking at it the way any other girl might look at a picture of a puppy or something. She then starts asking me all these weird questions about how I'd like to die. Yeah, how I'd like 
to die. I tell her I wouldn't like to die at all. I mean, it was legit the creepiest question I think I'd ever been asked, and she insists that everyone has a way they'd most want to die. I don't want to screw up the date or anything. She seemed crazy, and crazy girls can be real fun, if you catch my meaning, so I give her some throwaway response, like, whatever way is most pain-free. She starts telling me how that was a boring answer, and how she'd like to die of hypothermia, because it apparently makes you feel all warm and sleepy towards the end. How some victims of hypothermia have even taken their clothes off before they died and just laid down in the snow or whatever before their heart stops beating. She also then gave me this long in-depth speech about how taking another person's life would be better than even getting intimate to catch my drift. How that feeling of pure power must dwarf any feeling that drugs or alcohol have to offer. She then tells me how hot she thought it would be to watch me drown at the bottom of a pool while there's an audience and I'm totally naked. How it actually turned her on to see my final moments of desperation before my body went limp and floated around the tank. Then something about how the Vikings would make wings out of the skin on a person's back by peeling it off and spreading it out, calling it beautiful, how it was like art or something. When she's done telling me all of that and I'm suitably freaked out, she starts calling me pet and how she wanted me chained up at the end of her bed so she could do whatever she wanted with me. Now any other girl, I'd think that was incredibly kinky, but after what Lilith had just talked about, I really didn't think what she had in mind for me involved any kind of pleasure whatsoever. When it came to driving her home, she actually told me to stop a few blocks away from her house because she didn't want me to know exactly where it was that she lived at, saying that you couldn't be too careful these days with all the psychos in the world who use dating apps. Yep, she said that to me after she'd spent like an hour talking about all the ways she'd want to die or how she'd watch me die. As soon as I got home, I blocked her number. I've never been more scared of anyone like that before, let alone a girl I wanted to hook up with. So, Lilith, if you're reading this, let's not meet again. <laughs>